joint coordinator of uh, Center for Research in Post Humanities, Bakura University. Uh, this is the very first day of our uh, six month journey titled an international web lecture series on Beckett and the Post Human. Uh, let me share with you uh, the vision behind organizing uh, such a lecture series. Uh, many of you will remember that it was in 1941, Rabindranath Tagore wrote an essay in Bengali, uh, which is titled Sobhotar Shankar, and which could be loosely translated into English as The Crisis of Civilization. Uh, Tagore, with profound despair, wrote this essay. What pained Tagore most was the collapse of Western culture. Uh, if I use the term of Theodore Adorno and Hong Kaimer, uh, as they pointed out in the 1987 book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, a culture that brought so called civilization and light in the rest of the world stands guilty of barbarity and, and devastation. And Beckett's dramatic over is, in a sense, dramatic exp expression of what Adorno calls the disaster of enlightenment. But what if we read Beckett in an era of planetary crisis and mark the word, I'm using it in its plural form, not crisis, but crisis, because the, the crisis, because the crises are manifold. Uh, how do we, how do Beckett's work engage with the present manifold crisis, not just the crisis of civilization? This lecture series is an investigation into overarching question of our time. And I hope that the distinguished speakers of this series will make sense of how Beckett's works engage with the humanities most a uh, critical juncture. Uh, before that, uh, perhaps uh, everybody has joined. So let's check. Okay. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker, Professor uh, Thomas Cusino. Professor. Cusino is Emeritus Professor at Washington College. Uh, he is also a former visiting professor at the University of Paris Ravon and a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Bucharest and edited the newsletter of Samuel Wicket Society for several years and co-directed present the Samuel Wicket Conference at Lee Center Cultural International T. Surzi La Sala. Uh, I'm poor in uh, French, so pardon me, in Normandy. is the author of After No, After the No, After the Final No, Samuel Beckett's trilogy. Second one is Waiting for Godot, Form in Movement. This book is very close to my heart. Third one is Ritual Unbound, Reading Sacrifice in Modernist Fiction. Three part interventions, the novels of Thomas Bernhardt, an unheard novel, Fernando Pichot's book, The Book of This Poet, and the last one, The Science of Reading Uncanny Designs in Modernist Writing. And it's my pleasure to share this information that Professor Cusino has uh, generously and send this gift to our center. And we are very, very happy and uh, uh, we can't express it in words. Uh, Professor Cusino will be talking on uh, the Ezekiel's complex, doing it twice, uh, waiting for Godo. Uh, Professor Cusino, the whole platform is now all yours. Fine. So listen, uh, Sekunde, thank, thank you so much once again for the, for the invitation. And I, I think I will begin by sharing with the uh, other participants the, the story that I told you when we were just talking between ourselves a little while ago. 
You know, it was really funny. I, I was up at the local grocery store last evening, uh, and I mentioned to the manager of the grocery store, who's from Pakistan, I said, I'm going to be giving the Zoom talk in the city in, um, in India called Kolkata. Um, and I said, I never heard of it. I guess it must be some really little town. And he said, no, it's enormous. And it was only then that I realized that, of course, Kolkata is what we used to call, spell as Calcutta, C-A-L, da, 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 so and on from there. So anyway, um, I'm very, very happy to, uh, to be with you. I may, perhaps one day I'll visit you in person. I have gone, I will admit, I've gone on Travelocity a couple of times and I've, uh, I've checked out flights uh, not only from Philadelphia, but also from Paris. Um, I spend a lot of time in Bucharest in Romania. So maybe uh, maybe one day I will I will show up uh, not only on your computer screens but on your uh, desktop. Um, okay, so the um, uh, as I was going to mention the the title of my talk, the Ezekiel's Complex: Doing It Twice and Waiting for the Dough. I imagine that the subtitle of the talk uh, will be uh, immediately obvious to you. You'll understand, of course, waiting for the dough is in two parts, act one, they're waiting for the dough, act two, they come back and they're waiting for the dough yet again. Uh, the main title, the Ezekiel Complex, will need um, a bit more, a bit more of, of an explanation, which I will be giving to you as we go along. Um, I will begin, I thought maybe in a way there are two kind of simple ways of beginning the talk, um, and um, which reminds me years and years ago, I wrote a book, I mean, decades ago, I wrote a book on waiting for the dough, and there was one reviewer said that I brought um, uh, conciseness and clarity, conciseness and clarity to the discussion of the play. Um, and I hope that over the years, um, wait, did I lose, did I, oh, okay. I didn't lose contact. Did I know? I'm you know I'm not entirely uh, familiar with the the technology of um, of this presentation. But anyway, um, one simple way of beginning the talk uh, is to say that in a way it's a response. Can you see the title of the of the book that I'm holding up? It's Martin Esslin's The Theater of the Absurd, a very very famous book, which attached, of course. From, I mean, over the uh, many, many uh, decades, the uh, the tag of absurd, absurdity, and so on, absurdist theater to uh, to Samuel Beckett, um, and in a way, the um, the talk that I'm giving today is a response, a kind of uh, rebuttal. Uh, it offers at least an alternative to um, to the uh, the discussion or the the presentation. Of, uh, of Waiting for Godot as an example of the theater of the absurd that we find in Esslin's, Esslin's book, and which has, of course, acquired uh, quite extraordinary celebrity. Um, I want to say there are just a couple of lines, a couple of comments or uh, affirmations that Esslin makes in the book uh, to which I want to respond. Uh, he says that the, the plays that are gathered together and not only Beckett, but others as well, um, use quite different methods, quite different methods from conventional plays, and that they can be judged only by the standards of the theater of the absurd. Um, but rather than uh, rebutting uh, Esslin's claim myself, um, I'll let Beckett do it for me. And this just happened um, very serendipitously a couple of days ago, maybe a week ago, I was looking through some of the uh, other of, of Beckett's plays, and I came upon the stage directions for his play, Happy Days. And in the stage directions then, very briefly at the beginning of the play, uh, he gives what I would call his statement of method. And the statement of method is this. He says, maximum of simplicity and of symmetry, maximum of simplicity and of symmetry. I think one thing, about, a number of things, but one thing that one might immediately notice about the statement is how symmetrical it is that simplicity and symmetry uh, balance uh, go together very well indeed. 
The other thing, and what I find really fascinating, and this will be the, the kernel of the talk that I'm giving today, is just before he makes that statement, he gives very precise details about the mound in which Winnie is, uh, is buried up to her waist in Act 1 and then up to her neck in Act 2. He says he describes the mound in this way. He says there are gentle slopes down to the front and either side. Gentle slopes down to the front and either side of the stage. And then he says in the back, there is an abrupter fall, an abrupter fall to stage level. And in other words, and I'm going to summarize it, and this will be, as I say, it's the foundation of what I'm going to be talking about today, is the way in which, on the one hand, Beckett symmetrizes resemblances, right? So the left and the right of the stage of the gentle slope. But he's also, he, he's also symmetrizing antitheses. You have the gentle slope in front, and then in back, which of course you never see, you'd have to be told, uh, in, the, in the back you have the, um, the abrupter fall. So and it's that interplay, say the interplay between uh, the symmetrizing of resemblances and the symmetrizing of antitheses that's right there in the stage directions for, um, uh, for happy days. And the point that I'll be making is not only that that's the method that we find in Waiting for Godot, that we find throughout Beckett's work, but that it is a universal, the interplay between the two forms of symmetry is a universal principle that you find everywhere in all the, the great masterpieces, whether, whether it's uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, Metamorphoses, the Iliad, which I'm going to be talking about today, um, Oedipus the King, Hamlet, any, any number of, uh, of literary works then uh, in which the, that underlying principle, that underlying method, to use the term that, uh, that Martin Eslin uses, is, um, is, is in operation. Um, I want to mention to you too, I'm going to say a few things about Murphy today, not only about Waiting for Godot, but also one of uh, Beckett's early novels, the earliest published novel entitled Murphy. And Beckett himself once said that the, the seed of Waiting for Godot uh, uh, lies or lay in Murphy. Um, I don't know precisely what he had in mind by that, but what I see is, again, the similarity in the, that in the interplay of those two forms of symmetry, but the um, there's one place in Murphy. It's one of my, I, what it says about me that it's one of my favorite scenes in in Murphy. Um, but where um, oh no, I'm sorry, not uh, not Murphy, but in Malloy, uh, in which Malloy uh, going through the out in the forest, he comes upon a charcoal burner and he hits him over the head. He gets into a, a, a tiff with him. He hits him over the head, knocks him down, and then. He talks, he, he kicks him. He kicks him from one side. He says, I'd launched myself forward with all my strength and consequently a moment later backward, which gave the desired results. And then he says, and I, I, I'll summarize this. He's, he picks up his crutches. He goes to the other side and he kicks the poor charcoal bird who's down on the ground. He kicks him from the, the other side and he concludes, and this is his statement of method, as it were, he says, I always had a mania for symmetry. And it's the, uh, the mania then that we could say, to summarize it very clearly, a mania that leads him to balance the kicking from one side to the other. There's a, um, and when I mentioned said Murphy a moment ago, what I had in mind, there's a famous moment uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, this kind of balancing, this kind of symmetry, where the narrator is describing the first zone of Murphy's mind, and he says, here the kick that the physical Murphy received, the mental M Murphy gave. It was the same kick, but corrected as to direction. 
Um, that leads me, I'll just mention briefly then that I, I am working, I think uh, uh, Sukhinda may have uh, mentioned this, I'm working on a new book now called Balancing All, The Symmetrical Imperative of Writing. And it draws together the, uh, the title uh, is an echo, maybe some of you heard it, of um, uh, William Butler Yeats's poem, An Irish Airman Foresees His Death, in which the airman says, I balanced all, brought all to mind. And the sentence itself is a, is a wonderful example, to be sure, uh, not only in terms of what it says about balancing, but the form of the balancing as well. The other, and the statement of the the uh, what I'm calling the symmetrical imperative, uh, the best statement of it that I've come upon is by uh, uh, by by Socrates, and it reads uh, this. I may uh, I may I may quote it twice. I, I do think it, it is so important. Uh, Socrates says, "If measure and symmetry are absent from any composition in any degree." Ruin awaits both the ingredients and the composition. So if measure and symmetry are absent from any composition in any degree, ruin awaits both the ingredients and the composition. So the symmetrical imperative, as it were, then, is the key to the creation uh, let's say the creation within a particular historical moment, granting that, but the creation within a particular historical moment of a timeless, uh, I was going to say a timeless literary work, a timeless work in, uh, in, in whatever form uh, the, uh, the creator may be, may be working. Um, okay. There are two aspects then of the symmetrical imperative that I want to set forth uh, before I, I go ahead and look at particular works. The first of them is that each detail of a work, uh, uh, yes, each detail of a particular work, each single detail must be divided into two. So pretty obviously with waiting for the dough, the act of waiting for the dough is the is divided into two into two acts. Uh, there must be uh, two characters who are waiting for the dough, not a single one. Uh, if you have a couple that's waiting for the dough, then there must be a couple by antithesis, a couple that is not waiting for the dough, as in the case of uh, of Pazzo of Pazzo and Lucky. But I do have this idea then that maybe I'll use this term: the idea that the symmetrical imperative. Is is an impersonal, uh, is an anonymous. Um, but for all I know, it may be a post-human, uh, post-human term or a post-human force that guides the author in the in perhaps un unconsciously. It may be consciously, maybe unconsciously, maybe a combination of the two guides the author as he's. Um, as he's as he's perfecting his work, as he's immortalizing his work. Um, okay, and okay. The the second point, though, is that the the division between the two parts and the creation. I want to use this term: the creation of of bilateral symmetries between the two parts, as between Vladimir and Estragon, as between Pazzo and Lucky, the uh, symmetrical, uh, the bilateral symmetry between the, uh, the two couples, that, that, kind, that the formation of symmetries must occur on two levels, and on two, I'll say, symmetrically related levels. The first of them, is on the level of the human body or bodies of the protagonists in a work. On the, and on the, on the level of the action, we could say, of the work. Um, but also, secondly, it must occur on the level of what I call, what I call throughout 
as Satinta will know, throughout this book, uh, the seance of, of reading, I refer to as the architectural body of the, of the work. Um, and what I have in mind, and I'll mention this just parenthetically, is that, well, on the one hand, as I said, I never talk about the post-human body, though I have, I've been reading some articles and I've seen the appearance uh, of, that, uh, of, of that term that I do repeatedly, dozens and dozens of times in this book, The Seance of Reading, I use the phrase, the architectural body, and, and perhaps there's an interesting, and it, it may be for those of you who are working in the field of post-humanism, that there may be a useful analogy uh, between the two. I just want to say the term itself uh, comes from my reading of this book, if you can see the, the title. It's by the Romanian philosopher uh, Mircea Eliade. Uh, he wrote it in, in, uh, in Romanian, but the, it was translated into French, uh, Commentaire sur la légende de Maître Manole. Um, I don't want to say too much of it, about it right now. It may be a bit distracting. But uh, basically, uh, on the assumption that few of you uh, know about this Romanian ballad, The Legend of Master Manole, uh, Manole is a builder. He's building a, a, a cathedral. Uh, the walls of the, of the cathedral are continually collapsing. And what he learns is that he has to bury his wife alive. He has to bury his wife Anna alive in the walls of the monastery in order that, uh, that, the, that the walls stand. Um, and in his commentary again, in the Commentaire sur la légende de Manol, it hasn't been translated into English, but if, you, if you're curious about it, you can Google Eliade Manole, so Eliade, E-L-I-A-D-E, Manole, M-A-N-O-L-E. If you Google it, you'll find English language uh, explanations of, the, of, of what it's all about. Um, and what it is about and why it's, it's central and foundational to, uh, to, to my book, The Seance of Reading, is that uh, Eliade says in his commentary that the wife, Anna, doesn't simply die but rather she's incarnated, she's transformed into the, what he calls the architectural body of the monastery. And that, that metaphor, the architectural body, I'd never heard of it, it never occurred to me, but I find, found it very, very uh, provocative and very, very fruitful. Um, and, and thinking as well that perhaps in some way, it's analogous to uh, to what otherwise would be called the uh, uh, the post post human uh, body. Um, I was thinking that it, it, it may be well at this moment to uh, interject at least a brief observation about uh, waiting for the dough, and which very simply to notice, say, on the human level. Uh, we could say, it's, it's, it's a very obvious comment to make, that Vladimir and Estragon uh, are obedient to, uh, to, uh, to Godot. They act in, uh, their actions are in, in uh, uh, reflect uh, their obedience to Godot. And then at the same time, and what's less obvious, is the way in which, um, to begin with, uh, Beckett himself, is writing the play, and, and by the way, it's uh, it's worth pausing for a moment to realize that not only he wrote the play in the late 1940s, it's performed in the early 1950s, but in the 1970s, uh, he went to Berlin and he directed a production of the play uh, in German, then Warten auf Gudel, with, uh, with uh, German actors. And, and what he said, the play itself, as he had written it, was a mess of a play and that he wanted to give shape to the confusion. He wanted to create what he called form in music, and which I see very, very much as, as evidence, let's say, of Beckett working in obedience, giving shape to the confusion by recasting the play in obedience to what I'm calling the symmetrical, the symmetrical imperative. Uh, so to, excuse, excuse me. 
Um, if you have at hand that photograph that I sent you of Beckett directing Waiting for Godot. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Bonoram Bono uh, will be taking that photo. I have told you. Bonoram, are you here? There we are. As if by magic. So there's, there's Beckett in 1975 uh, directing the play. Um, and a, a photograph that reminds us of, of many, if, uh, Godot himself never appears on the stage, but Beckett was very, very much there on the stage uh, during, during rehearsals. And among other things, what I love about that photo is the, the parallel between uh, Pazzo uh, with his arms up like this, as though he's about to give some kind of order, and then Beckett with his arms who very clearly is giving an order uh, which uh, which uh, he expects the uh, actors in the in the play uh, to to obey. And what I find fascinating about the play, and uh, which my wife and I saw, it, it came to Paris in, in the spring of 1976, a year later. Um, and um, and 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 what what one realized is that. Well, the characters in the play are behaving uh, continuously throughout in obedience, uh, Vladimir Nestogon at least, in obedience to Godot as Lucky acts in obedience uh, to Pazzo. All four of them are very, very much acting, the actors then who play those roles as distinguished from the characters, the actors are very, very much uh, Acting in obedience to the directives that um, that Beckett gives them, I think that this is something I I was planning to to mention a little bit later. But now, as I'm looking at that photograph and remembering uh, the intense work that Beckett brought to the reshaping of the play, to giving shape to the to the confusion, that one of the things that I find so fascinating. And it's uh, it's very central to the um, to the seance of reading, which has a chapter uh, not only on on Godot but also on Endgame. Is that while the the um, the play, of course, is is entitled in English "Waiting for Godot," and uh, throughout the play, Vladimir and Estragon are aware, even though they like to forget, they're aware of their obligation of waiting for him that the stage direction given by Beckett now, not by Godot, the stage direction that Beckett, in the stage directions, uh, wait appears only once. I, I don't remember the exact context, it's not important, but in contradistinction then to wait, the stage direction pause occurs um, I, I know because I, I did a Kindle word search on it, it appears 84 times. And I, I did the same thing with Endgame and I, with a Kindle word search, and I noticed that uh, pause occurs um, 380 sometimes. So it's, it's just, I mean, every, every other, every, where, where you turn, every place you turn, every time you turn one way or the other, the uh, the stage direction pause is there, you know. Beckett once very famously quipped, uh, "In waiting for the dough, the audience is waiting for the dough to arrive. Uh, in Endgame, the audience is waiting for Clove to leave." He says, you know, "Throughout, yeah, I'm going to leave. I'm leaving. I'm getting ready to leave, and so on." And he and he never does. Um, but it, it's interesting to realize then that you know that that distinction. Let's say once again. Uh, between the human body of of the bodies of the uh, the character or characters who are uh, who are planning uh, who are either expecting someone to arrive or planning to leave them um, themselves, that Beckett on the level of the architectural body, if I can 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 be clear about that, on the level of the architectural body, he's not. He's, the, uh, he's using pauses not to create uh, an antithesis. So he's not creating an antithesis between expectation and frustration. 
is getting now back to the idea of bilateral symmetries. So they're waiting, they're expecting something to happen. Uh, what they're expecting to happen uh, repeatedly is not happening. Then in, in contrast to that, and on a higher level, on the, say, the, the architectural or maybe the post-human level, the pauses are creating a bilateral symmetry between movement and stasis, between sound and silence. And there's no opposition between the two. Rather, there's a reciprocity. And that's the, that's the, the main idea that I want to convey today about the method of the, of the symmetrical imperative. Again, the idea of it working both on the, the level of antitheses down here on the human level and, and then up here on the, on the higher level of the quote unquote architectural or post human body of the, of the work itself. Oh, listen, yeah, um, if, uh, oops, so Tinder, can, can you hold up the, uh, the cover? Can you make a, uh, an image of the, of the cover of the book? If not, I mean, I'm holding it up here and I think, can I, can I close this? Okay, uh, okay I, I'm, I'm taking an image of the, the cover and yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's probably okay. It's, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with this technology. I'm, I'm on a very small screen. But now when I, can, can everyone in the, in the audience see the cover of the book? Okay, I, I see yeses. Okay, I will see a whole bunch of yeses. Okay, fine. So listen, I'll put the book down um, just to, uh, to point out to you then, and may, I don't know if all of you will recognize uh, the cover of the book, but it, it is a photo of, um, of a late play by Beckett called Ohio Impromptu, uh, which uh, is, is I, I, it's, it's one of the most beautiful, one of the most powerful plays that Beckett ever wrote. I think it must have been in 1981, uh, there was a Beckett Symposium at Ohio State University that my, my wife and I went to. And, um, and the, uh, uh, it, it, there was a performance of it directed by Alan Schneider and with, um, with David Warrelaw, famous English actor, uh, playing the role of reader. So you have a, a reader and a, a listener are represented in the um, in that in that image, um, and what what is fascinating about it is in terms of the relationship between say the human body and the architectural body is on the level of the human body the 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 bilateral symmetry is that it's the situation of a man who was with a woman beloved woman uh, presumably a long period of time and now they've been separated so it's the story of a, of a separation and a very, a very painful a very traumatic separation uh, between the the man and woman and the reader who has a text there he's reading the story of the of the of, of the the man's life of his relationship with of his loss of the of the woman and 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 so on but what again if if you look at the the cover of the the book what you, the cover of my book and the image from the ohio impromptu beckett's play is you realize that on the can i can i hit that little x without Getting rid of good. Okay, just so I have a sense of what you're seeing. 
um, that uh, what Beckett has done is he's taken that very traumatic separation on the level of the human body, let's say, and he has transformed it into three different kinds of separation and separations that are not traumatic, uh, separations that are not associated with tension, but rather the release of tension. Okay, what I mean by that is so you have the, the relationship between the, the, oh good, right, fine, so you, you see it very clearly now. Um, the relationship between the man and woman, which has had a traumatic outcome, but Beckett translates it into the relationship first between reader and listener. And reader, readers, the reader and listener who are really indistinguishable from each other, um, except one is speaking and the other knocks every now and again the listener. The listener doesn't speak. But Beckett, the, both their heads are bowed throughout. So you see no expression on the faces of e either, one, either one of them. Um, uh, let me uh, mention parenthetically, there is a video performance of this uh, with the, uh, the English actor, um, who is it? Jeremy Irons, Jeremy Irons. Right, who plays both roles, and the the defect, the, the really serious problem with that video, and you can all see it. Just go on YouTube, bring up Ohio Impromptu, and you'll see it with the Jeremy Irons. Um, is that it, uh, in that video you see his face, and the the face of the reader is very very calm. He's simply he's reading the story. There are no emotion whatsoever. And then you see the face of the of the listener who's listening, hearing the story of the separation between himself and this woman, the loss of the woman. And you're, oh, oh, oh. Like, this is, it, it spoils the the whole effect of what Beckett wanted to do was to uh, to to free to free the bilateral relationship here between reader and, and listener. Uh, uh, to free the bilateral relationship uh, between the um, the man and the and the woman by transforming it into the architectural body of the relationship between reader and listener. Okay, and then going on, you notice it's not only he, he takes it even to a higher level, a more a higher level of, of architectural completion, of alchemical completion in a way. Not only he's got the bilateral the unemotional bilateral relation between reader and, and listener, but also he has the relationship between black and white. Again, a reciprocal relationship, nothing, nothing the least bit traumatic about it. Rather, it's a very, very beautiful stage image. And then beyond the, re the reciprocal, the bilateral, the harmoniously bilateral relationship, between white and black, uh, unlike the traumatic relationship between the man and the woman, you also have the bilateral, the non-traumatic bilateral relationship between, um, uh, not only between uh, white and black, but between light and dark. It's a very, very powerful uh, stage image. And when it was performed uh, at Ohio State, we um, we were brought into a, a darkened theater. We could hardly find our way to the seats in the theater, completely black. And then the light comes up, focused very very intently on that uh, on that stage. Oh, will I ever get to waiting for the dough? How how, how long should I talk? Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, twenty two, it's twenty two eleven here. Um, because some, someone says wonderful about something anyway. Um, I don't know if it's about what I'm saying. Listen, let me... Um, oh, wait, do you, do you have... You have a copy of uh, 
of Ezekiel's amphora, don't you? Sekunda? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, see, if, if, you, if you could put that up, I'm, I'm going to try to, uh, to skip ahead a bit because um, otherwise I'll, I'll never get to waiting for the dough. This one. There is another one. Oh, okay. Well, that's the um, yeah, that's the symmetry of the of the Iliad itself. Um, okay. Listen, since you've put that up, uh, let me just say to the audience that the um, the title of my talk, the Ezekiel Complex, it refers. If you've seen the poster for the talk. You've seen at least a small image of the amphora that was crafted by uh, the Greek potter, a Greek potter named Ezekias. And the title of the amphora is, um, is Achilles and Ajax playing a board game. Okay, what I'd like you to see and it, it would be useful to have the, the image at hand, but you can look it up yourself later if, um, if it doesn't appear on the screen. What you'll notice is that the scene depicted on the amphora, the vase then, that was crafted by Ezekiel, appears to be completely harmonious. It is the, a bilateral symmetry form of the of the of the amphora is what we would call is based on a bilateral symmetry uh, be, between left and right and a bilateral symmetry then that creates an effect of perfect harmony okay what you don't see and your attention has to be called to this detail is right at the center of the amphora where you have Achilles and Ajax playing the board game, uh, you'd have to have a, a very magnified image of, uh, of the, um, the, the confrontation or the encounter, let's say, between them. And you'd also have to know Greek uh, or have to read, some, some as I did, uh, an essay by someone who does read Greek that tells you that Achilles has defeated Ajax. It, they're playing a, a game of dice, and Achilles says four. The number four is coming out of his mouth, and the number three is coming out of the mouth of Ezekiel. So in other words, and why I, I find this fascinating, is that Ezekiel has not only created a symmetry based on resemblances, but he has also symmetrized the antithesis he's created a bilateral symmetry out of the antithesis between achilles and ajax and from there i mean that's uh, the 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 title of the of the of the work is achilles and ajax playing a, a board game i turn that into the in into the ezekiel complex which is pretty clearly i suppose an echo of Freud's idea of the Oedipus complex, that in other words, Freud's idea that there is an underlying pattern that emerges through analysis, that emerges from the dreams of his patients. And the point that I make is that there is, an, there is uh, a, uh, a hidden pattern that emerges through analysis of great literary works going from Homer's Iliad to Beckett's Waiting for Godot, in which we see again this interplay, there it is, uh, the, uh, the interplay, the intertwining between, uh, 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 between resemblance or, or sy symmetries based on resemblance, symmetries are the very, very good with the blow up. Thanks so much, Sekinda. Um, yeah, that's really perfect that that you well, there's so much that one can can say about it. But rather uh, than continuing to to talk about it and having made the point, that you have the you know the overt harmony, the overt emphasis on resemblance, and then 
in very, you know, you can hardly see it. And again, you have to know Greek to realize that there is a confrontation uh, going, going on there. Now, the, the fascinating thing is that the, well, Ezekiel is, it, it's, it's an utterly brilliant decision on his part. He does not represent a scene, an actual scene from the Iliad. There's no scene of Achilles and Ajax, believe me. There is no scene of Achilles and Ajax playing a board game in the in Homer's Homer's epic poem. But what he does do in this amphora, why I call it the Ezekiel, it leads me to the formulation of the Ezekiel complex, is that it reveals the hidden design of Homer's Iliad. Okay, what I mean by that, and Sukhinder, uh, if you could now put up that first image of the um, of the the say the architectural, well, called the architectural body of the Iliad. Uh, yes, you yes. Know, the, the, one, the, 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 the present the one, previous one. one? Uh, right, the previous one, the entire that shows the entire poem. Uh, I would request you to present the previous one. Uh, the the previous one, the the one that you did have up that that has the entire the the uh, the diagram of of the entire Iliad. Oh, I see someone else is doing. It. Okay, good. And can that be uh, can that be expanded? It it doesn't really matter a whole lot. I just wanted uh, I wanted the uh, the audience to see at least that. In effect, what um, uh, what Ezekiel has done is he's inverted the relationship between, say, the the architectural and the human body of the of the Iliad. But what, I should explain very quickly what I mean by that. He shows us the the perfect harmony, uh, bilateral resemblances. And minimizes the role of, um, of of antithesis, of conflict, of confrontation. And what we notice then is in the in the Iliad, what Homer has done is he's he's crafted a poem in which it, which is the reverse of Ezekiel's amphora. That, in other words, it's the clash between the the Greek army and the Trojan army that we're most aware of, that it's happening over and over and over again. And it's only through the use of this diagram. Do I have the... Yeah. <clears throat> it's a diagram that I found in, in this book, Homer and the Heroic Tradition by Cedric Whitman. It's a book that I read when I was an undergraduate at Boston College back in the 1960s. And it made a, a very, very strong impression on me. And it's really the basis of the, of the work that I'm doing now on the, uh, the symmetrical imperative of, of writing. Because it was in reading Cedric Whitman's book that I first discovered this pattern, this geometrical pattern, which I would never, never have been aware of. And in other words, the idea that on the human level, He's got this face-to-face -face between the two armies and a face-to-face -face that, that leads to, to massacre upon massacre. Uh, but then underlying it, hidden, as it were, is this face-to-face -face throughout from beginning to end, the face-to-face -face between the episodes of the, of the Iliad that create this effect of perfect harmony. Uh, so can you, uh, whoever is, is showing, could you, could you show the second image of the, um, related to the, what I call the architect, the, the architectural body of, um, of the Iliad. 
Yes, good uh, Would you please present the architectural body of the lead? Uh, there is another. Okay, fine. Did you say uh, what fine? What file or photo file? It's the one with uh, books one and twenty-four of the Iliad. It shows the uh, the symmetry between them. Yes, uh, it is what file and it is titled Architectural Body of the Iliad. There it is. is Thank one? you. Yeah. Oh, oh no, this, that's the uh, table of contents of my book. No, it's it's the uh, the two books, books one and twenty four of the Iliad. The the title should be the Architectural Body of the Iliad, um, number two. Yes, this one. Thank you, Balaram. Well, uh, listen, no, but since since you've put that up, um, the architecture. Balaram, the, uh, please please uh, present the previous one, the architectural body of PDF. It has another word for him. Yeah, I had two for the um, for the Iliad. Um, so, Kendra, maybe I'm going to be running out of time, I think, and um, I wonder if I should, if I should just jump ahead to, uh, to Godot. Okay, well, listen, that, that's all right. The, uh, what has just been put up about the architectural body of Murphy. Um, oh. There is another file I have again. Say, say, say just a minute. Yes. And we don't have uh, such any time constraint. So we will be happy to listen your talk. Well, listen. Let me um, let me jump ahead to uh, what's coming up. Oh, there we are. Okay. Uh, can you see, can you bring the whole thing up? So it, it's cut off a little bit. There you go. Okay. Um, so I, I just wanted to, uh, again, in, in, to develop uh, briefly that metaphor of the, uh, of the architectural body as opposed, and maybe we could call it the post-human body of the, of the Iliad, as opposed to the human bodies of the the Greek and and um, and Trojan soldiers that are face to face throughout the um, or throughout the Iliad, that we see then, and I have to get my copy for a moment. Yeah, um, that we see in the, the relationship between uh, books one and twenty and twenty four. Um, book one begins with the funerals of unnamed Greek soldiers. Um, book twenty four, excuse me, ends with the funeral of the Trojan hero Hector. So you have a balancing there between the the opening scene, the very first scene in the Iliad. And the very last scene, um, 
the second scene in book uh, book one, the quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon, uh, which leads to the taking of Bryces, the woman the, uh, of Achilles' mistress, from him. Uh, and then that corresponds at the, the, the next to the last scene in book 24, the reconciliation between Pri the reconciliation between Priam and Achilles, in which Achilles gives Hector's corpse uh, to Priam to his to his father. Um, I won't go into the other details, but just that gives you an idea then of the very very careful, a very this kind of let's say again this mania for symmetry uh, that Homer had not only in um, and and in, in giving shape to the chaos of the of the Trojan War. He shapes it in terms, remember, with um, on the level of action, uh, there's no, finally, there's no difference between killing and being killed. Uh, if you kill someone, you're going to be killed. So Hector kills Patroclus, Achilles kills Hector, and outside of the time frame of the poem, we know that Paris will kill Achilles. So the, the distinction between killing and being killed turns into a, a very neat, a very nicely shaped uh, bilateral, bilateral symmetry. Um, I'll go ahead to, um, to waiting for Godot, unless, um, you know, I, I, I really do want to talk about Murphy, and I, I hope I'm not delaying, uh, I'm making you wait for my talking about Godot. Uh, would, it, would it be possible to put up that, uh, uh, that he that heading of the um, the architectural body of Murphy, yes, and there are thirteen chapters in Murphy. Um, I'm presenting. Is, if it's possible, yeah, it's. I wonder if it's going to be going to be too small for people actually to see it. Um, you know, if there was some way of making it available as a as a handout, well. Yeah, if you enlarge it and then, you know, uh, scroll down, not right now, leave it there where it is. And what I wanted to point out is on the level of the human body of Murphy, again, keeping in mind the relationship between human and architectural bodies, on the level of the human body, what we notice are the, are the antitheses, are the, the symmetrizing of oppositions on that level. Um, the most obvious of them, there are two or three of them that I'll mention. Uh, the most obvious, and everyone talks about it in relation to the novel. It's a very funny book, by the way. Those of you who, who haven't read it, I, I recommend it <laughs> very, very strongly. Um, but in the, uh, uh, in, in the novel, then, there's an opposition between Murphy's body in Murphy's mind, and the narrator tells us, Murphy felt himself split in two. There's the principle of symmetry to begin with. He felt himself split in two, a body and a mind. They had intercourse, apparently, but he felt his mind to be body tight. So the absolute opposition between mind and body. There's another opposition uh, within Murphy's heart, H-E-A-R-T, the two extremes of his heart. Um, the, the narrator says, on one moment, uh, uh, one moment, the heart was in such labor that it seemed on the point of seething, of contracting. The next, in such evolution, that it seemed on the point of bursting. So contracting, burst, uh, the extremes then of contraction and bursting. Um, and then the, uh, the, the, uh, the last one that I'll mention is, um, oh, I don't, I don't have it here in my notes, but I remember it well enough. He says that it's the, um, he has a relationship with a, a young woman named Celia. And the narrator tells us the part of himself that he uh, uh, that he hated was drawn to Celia. The part of himself that he loved shriveled up 
had the slightest contract with con contact with her. So again, uh, a, a, a symmetry based on antitheses. Okay, if you look at the at what I call the architectural body, it's going to be hard to see because you've got to. Yeah, I think you have to have all, all 13 chapters. Um, let, me, let me just say, the, uh, okay, if, what, go to the end, go to the bottom. Okay, look, in the very, at the very end, um, the, the, the very last chapter, you have uh, Mr. Willoughby Kelly. He's uh, what Celia's paternal grandfather, I think it is. And he's in a wheelchair, and he's scurrying around in his wheelchair, and he's got a, a kite tied to a, tie, tie to a string. And the, the point that I make is I, I put in, uh, in, in parentheses or in brackets is it's a very minor episode. But in other words, you, really, you, you don't need it at all. Except, and you realize if you scroll back, if you go up to chapter one, if you can do that, in chapter one, right, good, Murphy is in his rocking chair. So not a wheelchair, but a rocking chair, and a rocking chair in which he's tied himself, to which he's tied himself with scarves. And so you have the, the scarves, the, the analogy, the reciprocity between the scarves and the, and the kite. And the point that I make in, in brackets, of course, is that it is indeed a major episode. It's one of the most important episodes of all in the, in the novel. And what Beckett is doing then is he's creating a symmetry between things that, I mean, they're not, a minor and a major episode are not entirely opposites of each other. They can complement each other as they do in this novel. And that Beckett very clearly, again, with his mania symmetry, he doesn't end simply with Murphy's death. Sorry for giving it away if you don't know. Yeah, Murphy dies at the, at the end. He doesn't uh, end it with Murphy's uh, uh, death, but rather he symmetrizes the sequence of events by including this very minor episode at the end. Okay, he does something similar, reversing it with uh, chapter two, in which Celia visits, as I say, the corpse like, uh, the a corpse like Mr. Kelly. He's described. He's he's hardly human at all, and it's a very minor episode. Uh, if uh, if the publisher were running out of paper and he wanted to cut some scenes, give it a chapter two. What do we need chapter two for? We don't need it at all. Except if you scroll down, if you look at chapter 12, the corresponding chapter, you see Celia visits Murphy's corpse. Murphy's been incinerated by an explosion. He's dead. And that, to be sure, is a very major episode. So that it's that movement back and forth, back and forth, that symmetrizing of episodes, symmetrizing them in a harmonious way which um, which is is in contrast then which forms the architectural body of the of the novel as contrasted with the human body in which on the level of uh, of of, of the, the bilateral level always produces tension while the um, on the uh, on the level of the architectural body the same bilateral principle uh, produces a release of tension. And may, maybe just, uh, I will pause for a moment and, and point out that what I, what I have in mind is that, you know, in a, a conventional play, let's say, or in a conventional literary work, a minor literary work, perhaps, of any sort, the, the resolution of a tension the release of, or just, yeah, the resolution, the resolution of a tension, of a, te a tension occurs at the end of the work. But in Waiting for Godot, as in Murphy, as 
in the Iliad, as in, in Oedipus, as in Hamlet, as in any number of works, the resolution, the release of tension, occurs not at the end, is not restricted to the end of the work, but rather it's happening continuously throughout the work, and happening continuously through the transformation of bilateral symmetries based on antithesis into bilateral symmetries based on resemblance and which lead then to the creation of, of harmony. So that, relate, that, that perpetual, that continuous relationship between harmony and disharmony, which is um, rather than disharmony throughout the work, the creation of harmony or resolution at the at the end. And there's nothing, it's not theater, you know, it just killed me. I, I was I was Googling the other day, uh, looking up Murphy just to see what what people are saying of, about Murphy. And um, and one of the first things I saw was the description of Murphy as an absurdist novel. And I said, oh my God, oh no, I have to give this talk in Kolkata in which I, I offer an alternative in the form of the, of the symmetrical imperative and the idea of, the, of, of, of works then. Let me, um, I'm gonna pause for a moment. I'm, I'm, there's something suddenly came to mind. There's a, one of my absolute favorite writers, and I'm going to refer at some point, this is uh, Simone Weil, the French philosopher, and this is uh, La Pesanteur de la Grasse, is a posthumously published work uh, translated into English as, as Gravity and Grace. But the reason that I suddenly hesitated and thought I have, uh, this is why I'd like to say it, is she has a, an essay on the Iliad. Of course, she wrote it in French. It's translated into English. Uh, the Iliad or the, the Poem of Force, F-O-R-C-E, the Iliad, the Poem of Force. And it begins, I think in the very first sentence, she says the, uh, the hero, the center of the Iliad is force. And by the way, she wrote this just uh, very shortly after uh, the Nazi occupation of, of France. And, and, um, and, and it's very, very much, I mean, when she talks about the brutality and the destructiveness, uh, the irresistible <laughs> quality, the way it seizes uh, human beings, uh, she certainly has the, the Nazis very, very much in, in mind. Um, and what I'm thinking, what I'd, I'd like to say then is that along with the, the force and say in Waiting for Godot, the force represented by Godot as the force represented by Pazzo and the submission that, um, uh, that, that Lucky owes to, to Pazzo and that Vladimir and Estragon owe to Godot. Uh, that submissiveness to a, a dehumanizing, say, to a dehumanizing force is countered throughout the Iliad as it is countered as well throughout Waiting for Godot by, say, in, in, uh, in contrast to submission, let's say obedience, as though the alternative to submission is not simply freedom, why don't we simply you know, throw this off, but rather is obedience to what I call the symmetrical imperative. And that, that is a, um, I mean, it, 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 it bears a, uh, there is an analogy to be sure with the dehumanizing force that's exerted on human on the human characters, but that it has a ultimately a a, a liberating uh, aspect. You know what I, I 
I, I, I talked about this in a video that I did a few years ago. Uh, you, you see it waiting for the dough. Pazzo has that whip. He's whipping and he's shouting and so on and giving, giving orders. But you look at that picture of Beckett directing his German actors in Wattenau Godot in 1975. And, and you realize, and certainly when you look at his, there it is again, and you read his production notebook, he has this, the most precise details in which he's not cracking a whip, but he's really giving orders. And those actors are obeying what Beckett tells, him, tells them to do. And it's their obedience that creates the alternative to, um, and creates a, a release from the, from the, 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 the slavish subservience of um, of wow. Vladimir Vistugan to Godot, and also the slavish uh, subservience of the Greek and I mean it's crazy what the the, the Greek and, and and Trojan soldiers are fighting about. It is the utter senselessness, the utter, if I may use a word, the utter absurdity of. And so in that way, as long as excuse me, as long as we use absurd to suggest a continuity from the very, very beginning, from the most foundational work of Western literature, certainly uh, for us in, in, um, in the West, in, in, the, in the Iliad, and up through something like Waiting for Godot. So, for, I mean, for Martin Esselin, he uses the phrase theater of the absurd to suggest a rupture, a, 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 an utter difference, a departure, in this contemporary theater, what was contemporary a long time ago, um, and um, a, a rupture then, a break between that and um, and um, and traditional traditional theater, traditional literature, and where in contrast to that, as maybe I've said too many times, I see a, a continuity. Um, but I, I have been talking for a long time, and I, in a way, you know, I haven't gotten down to a, a lot of um, a lot of details. By the way, should I can I bring my book along? Um, no, I guess not. I'm, I'm up in my office. My other books are back home. Um, I did. I think I mentioned before. I, I wrote a book on waiting for Godot called uh, Waiting for Godot, Form in Movement. And it came out, of, I mean, gosh, it was about 30 years ago. And I was looking at it again, and I, I would rewrite it. There were certain things that I, I don't like about, about what I do, especially in the introduction. But that book is based on Beckett's on this production that Beckett is directing. And let me pause for a moment. Uh, the production itself is available on YouTube. If you go on YouTube and type in Vatten, Vatten, W-A-R-T-E-N, Vatten auf Godot, uh, it'll come up. And it's, a, it's an utterly brilliant, it's a, a very, very beautiful uh, production of the, of the play. <coughs> Excuse me of the of the play, and um, oh, I, I know uh, the the other thing I, I wanted to not just to promote my book, and you don't have to go and buy it. It's very expensive now on uh, on Amazon. Uh, it's online. If you just go Cousineau, Beckett, Godot, something like that, it, it will come up. And there there are a lot of details, so I, I won't feel so guilty about not having to talk very much today about actual details of the of Beckett's of Beckett's production and the way in which he creates an architectural body. But I, I will tell you this, uh, and especially I think for those for, for those of you who may not know the play or may not know it all that well, if you if you go to YouTube 
and watch Beckett's production. It's you know it's for a couple of hours, I guess. But even if you didn't watch the whole thing, you would have an experience. And I'll step back just for a moment. Oh, there you are. Yeah. So the um, and the uh, again the PDF is is online, so you can read it for free. And there there are a number of things about. And I, I will uh, I'll probably mention uh, at least uh, one or two favorite ones. But as I said, um, my, I think I did mention, my wife and I saw Beckett's production in Paris in the spring of 19, uh, 19, oh my God, 1976. That was almost, oh my God, almost 50 years ago. Um, and I mean, I knew the play. I had read it at Boston College uh, many years before as an undergraduate, but I, I didn't really know it that well. And I didn't at any particular, and I don't, I don't understand German. I don't understand spoken German. And what I realized, and what you'll notice if you go on YouTube and watch the production, is you can very easily forget that Vladimir and Estragon are are waiting for Godot because there's nothing in the visual aspect of the play. There's nothing in the the way in the what Beckett called the form in movement that he created. There's nothing in it's a very, very highly choreographed production. If anything, in looking at it you would say, well, you know, it's kind of like a modern dance in a way, and um, because you see actors pausing, then they'll move, they'll stop talking, then they'll talk. There's this alternation, this back and forth throughout. And, and, um, and, and you could say at the end of the play, if you are watching it on YouTube, listening to it in German, not understanding what they're saying, what you will understand is the rhythmic quality, the way in which of the back and forth. They don't just talk in a, a normal way, but it's very, very highly stylized. Um, you know, Beckett said that uh, Endgame, that he, he envisioned it as a cantata for two voices, a song then that would be sung by two voices. And that effect is very, very much there already in in waiting in, in certainly in, in his um, in his direction he directed uh, waiting for Godot long after he wrote uh, Endgame. So the and and um, and the other thing is you wouldn't realize that the action of the play is incomplete because again the on the human level of course it's incomplete. But on the level of the architectural body of the play, it's perfectly complete. You know, at the at the very end, um, at the very end of Act Act One, <coughs> excuse me, um, Vladimir and Estragon are sitting on a stone, and there's that famous exchange: "Shall we go? Yes, let's go." And then the uh, the stage direction. They do not move. A um, couple of things to say about that. But we notice that uh, Beckett ends both uh, both acts one and two with that exchange. But in act one, he has Vladimir and Estragon sitting on the stone. And in act two, they're standing by the tree. In act one, it's Estragon who says, shall we go? Vladimir says, yes, let's go. In, uh, at the end of Act Two, it's Vladimir who says, "Shall we go?" and Estragon who says, "Yes, let's go." The same stage direction; they do not move. And the the question is, well, who is not moving? Why don't they move? And the the answer to the question depends on who they is. If it's Vladimir and Estragon, they don't move. Well, maybe because they're waiting. But if it's the actors who don't move, it's because the stage directions tell them not to move. 
And the reason that Beckett tells them through the stage directions not to move is he wants them to be perfectly immobilized, perfectly silent, and he wants the light to go down slowly, slowly, slowly to create this very, very powerful visual image, which is the beginning of you know, throughout all of his, his later plays, Ohio Impromptu, again, the, the cover of my book on the seance of reading, the stage images, the visual images that Beckett creates in those plays are absolutely stunning. Um, I, I will give you this one example, and you can, if you're interested in it, you can go online, get the PDF of my book, um, which, uh, again, according to this reviewer years and years ago, said that it, 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 he said it brings clarity and coherence, clarity and consistency, clarity and coherence, something like that, to a work uh, often made uh, overly complicated by obtuse commentary. And I, I hope I have not been obtuse today, but have brought uh, clarity and, and consistency to the to my reading. The one detail that um, that comes to mind, and maybe I'll I'll finish with it, and perhaps there'll be some questions, or we can get on to other things. But is the um, in terms of the visual image, the relationship between the tree and the stone, uh, I'm as sure as I can be in the original direction, the original stage direction, the original edition of the of the play. Um, I don't. There's there's only the tree. I believe the the uh, stage direction was um, twilight, something like that, a country road a tree and then at some point and in the edition that i have um there's a reference to a, a mound so along with the tree there's a mound uh beckett in his production notebook waiting for godot vatnov godot and uh, which is available it's not it's not all that expensive i saw on amazon it sells for about $30, um, and it's a, ver it's a very valuable uh, source of um, all the, 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 the work that Beckett put into it. Um, but in the, um, in the production notebook, he refers to the, what was a mound, he refers to it as the stone. And in the German production, it is indeed a stone that's matched with the, the tree. So you have a very, to my mind, a, a very, a very compelling, a, a visually very satisfying bilateral relationship, if that's not too heavy a term, bilateral relationship between the tree and the, and the stone as con on the architectural level, as contrasted with the bilateral relationship between expectation and frustration with respect to the, the arrival, the non-arrival of, of Godot. Um, and the other thing, is I found it quite fascinating, and I, I put it in, in my book, that in his, uh, in, in his uh, stage directions, Beckett, or in his commentary on the, uh, on Waiting for Godot, he says that um, Estragon belongs to the ground and uh, as opposed to uh, Vladimir who looks up to the sky uh, Estragon belongs to the stone Vladimir belongs to the tree and the interesting thing you'll see this right away in Beckett's production the actor who plays Estragon is kind of short and fat like a stone. So there's a physical resemblance between Estragon and the stone to which he belongs. Um, and um, in contrast to that, bilateral relationship to it, symmetrized with it, 
you have uh, es uh, Vladimir, excuse me, who's very tall and slender and who looks very much like the tree. And the other thing is that, and again, Beckett is very clear about this, he wants Estragon to spend a lot of time sitting on the stone or near the stone, as he wants Vladimir to spend a lot of time standing next to the tree so that you have the, the symmetrizing of the antithesis between tree and stone. You have the symmetrizing of the antithesis between immobile, non-human stage props and the, the couple formed by Vladimir and Estragon. So you have, again, these antitheses, but antitheses that produce a release of tension, produce an experience of pleasure as you, as you watch, as you're listening in German and not understanding it, you're seeing all these really nice, neat, very, you know, very pleasurable, again, movements and, and arrangements on the, on, the, on the stage. So, you know, in a way, it all goes back and I, I was looking again a, a little bit at, um, at Aristotle's Poetics, in which he talks about tragedy, and he says that tragedy arouses the tragic emotions of pity and fear, but then also it produces a catharsis. And, and, and I would say that, again, that's a, a universal principle. I, I rephrase it in terms of the symmetrical imperative by saying the pity and fear, or maybe just the plain boredom in waiting for the dough, come from a, a bilateral relationship between expectation and frustration. Um, and the, the, the catharsis is, is similarly created by these bilateral patterns. And the, the one point that, and, 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 and so again, um, I, I disagree, disagree entirely with Martin Eslin's uh, contention that Beckett's theater is based on principles that are just so entirely different from, uh, and I'm, well, the, I would just say that the, the principle that underlies Waiting for the Doe as Murphy, as everything that Beckett ever wrote, uh, goes all the way back um, to Homer. And even before Homer, of course, it goes back to geometrical pottery, which I mean, that's a fascinating subject that you see originally you go back to the Mycenaean period, see these vases that are perfectly symmetrical. And then you see, and, and with no ornamentation, then you see ornamentation in a later period, the ornamentation very nicely balanced. And then, at a later period, you see the representation of human figures. And what kind of human figures? Very often soldiers, soldiers who are killing each other at the, at the very center. And so again, that symmetrical principle uh, right there in, 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 uh, in human prehistory, before anything was ever, was ever written. Have I have I exhausted you, Sikandar? Are you still there? Are you? No, sir. Uh, I am. How, how, how are we doing? Patiently. Oh my God! Sir. So, sorry. I'm listening to you patiently, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Um, oh, I, I mean, I, I I could go on and on, but in in my in my final breath, maybe let me say, I just. The other thing, I'm really, you know, I'm very, I'm very combative in a way. Um, and along with um, uh, going one-on-one -on -one with uh, Martin Esselin and, and refuting his claim of, um, of the exceptional uh, method of, of the, the idea of Beckett being guided by a very different method and his work being evaluated by very, very different standards, from and I would say from other 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 masterpieces, um, 
My my other bet noir, as it were, is the excuse me the Freudian interpretation, the Freudian interpretation of Oedipus the King, and also of Hamlet. Um, and there's a very famous book I'm trying to remember now. Um, and anyway, the uh, oh Ernest Jones. Ernest Jones was a um, a British philo uh, a follower of Freud who wrote a book on, um, okay, have it. hold on a sec. Oh yeah. Um, Hamlet and Oedipus by Ernest Jones, uh, subtitled or described as by its publisher, a classic study in psychoanalytical, psychoanalytic uh, criticism. And you know, so what Freud, what Freud says about Sophocles' Oedipus is that the quote unquote Oedipus complex is right there. It's on the table. I mean, you'd have to be blind not to see that, uh, that, that the, the twin crimes or the, the twin uh, taboos against parasite and incest are violated. And then Freud says that uh, Hamlet, he interprets Hamlet as again um, uh, based on a, uh, 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 or, or say staging the return of the Oedipus complex, but an Oedipus complex which is disguised, that you have to analyze the play and you see. And there's a famous production of, um, of Hamlet. You can see it on, on YouTube with Laurence Olivier playing the role of Hamlet. And at the very beginning, as I haven't seen it for a while, but I think it's at the very beginning, you see a sign of a bed, the marriage bed of Hamlet's parents. And there's a voiceover that says, Hamlet, the play, about a man who loved his mother too much, something like that. Um, so it's a, a reading of an interpretation of Oedipus based on the quote unquote Oedipus complex. And what I'm doing in my, um, uh, in the book that I'm working on now is I'm, uh, I will be along with many other works, I will be interpreting um, uh, both Oedipus and Hamlet in terms not of the with respect not in with respect to the Oedipus complex but with respect to what I call the Ezekius complex and maybe um let me just look at my notes for a moment though so I don't dither yeah okay so the way it works is is this: with respect to um, to, Oedip to Sophocles' play *Oedipus the King*, um, you have the 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 bilateral symmetrizing of antitheses, but of antitheses that create a conflict or that create a tension. There's something contradictory about the um, about this this form of symmetrizing. And what I have in mind is, first of all, the idea that in the play, Oedipus is both the cause of the plague, P-L-A-G-U-E. He is the cause of the plague that has fallen upon um, Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, thanks for putting that up, and I'll, I'll say a few words about it, and I'll end with, uh, with those few words. So that um, that Oedipus is both the the cause of the plague and the solution. Um, we also notice in the play the contradiction is he tries to prevent the parasite and incest, and in trying to prevent that, attempting to prevent turns into fulfillment. Something like in Waiting for Godot, the expectation that Godot will arrive turns into its frustration. 
Uh, similarly, in Oedipus, Oedipus, after he talks with uh, um, Tiresias, the prophet at the beginning, he, he does everything he can to prove his innocence. And in attempting to prove his innocence, he proves his guilt. With respect to the architectural body, where you have the the um, the symmetrizing of resemblances, at times the symmetrizing of antitheses that are not contradictory, that do not create tension, that do not lead to a catastrophe. Um, you notice that you have the the chorus, of course, in Oedipus, and the choral odes are divided into um, uh, into strophes on the one hand and antistrophes on the other. So there's a division, a split between the two parts of the of the chorus. In the strophe, the chorus is turned one going in one direction. In the antistrophe, it goes in another direction. And the the two parts of the of the choral ode are like the left hand and the right hand, as it were. They come together, they flow. There's a nice Influence rather than a conflict uh, between the between the two. Uh, the um, the other another uh, detail from the the play Oedipus is you notice that at the end of the play there's a shepherd and a messenger, a, a, a shepherd from uh, from Thebes, a messenger from Corinth, who come together at the end of the play and who confirm Oedipus's guilt. It's more complicated than that, but just say they confirm his guilt. Well, those are the, it's the, that shepherd from Thebes and the messenger from Corinth, though they are the ones who, when he was a little baby, saved him from dying up in the, uh, what is it, the, uh, the hills, the Mount, uh, Mount Kithra, I guess, is where he was supposed to, he was supposed to be abandoned. Um, so there's a, Quite a powerful symmetrizing then the the shepherd the messenger that knew Oedipus when he was a little baby now will return and identify him as a full grown man. Um, my favorite of the and my favorite because no one else ever talks about it I think and I can maybe claim to have discovered it is and I, I mentioned this I gave another talk not too long ago. But at the very end of the play, and it's like with waiting for Godot, the, the, the action, the expectation of Godot's arrival doesn't happen. Remember, in Oedipus, the lifting of the plague doesn't happen either. Not only that, but Oedipus is, Oedipus is not exiled. He's not expelled from Thebes at the end of the play. It's just a, a minor playwright would create the resolution by having him expelled uh, at the exile at the end. What happens at the end, Oedipus asks Creon to exile him, to banish him. And Creon says, no, I have to go to the Delphic Oracle to find out what I should do. And Oedipus says, <coughs> why? You know. You've been told already, and Oedipus is exactly right that on the level of action, Creon knows perfectly well, but in terms of the symmetrical imperative, and Sophocles, who's writing the play, in terms of in, in obedience to the symmetrical imperative, um, so, uh, uh, Sophocles yes, has uh, Creon go back to the Delphic Oracle. Why? Because at the very beginning of the play, he had, Cre he had Creon arriving from the Delphic Oracle. So it creates a very, very nice balancing in that way as, as, as well. Um, oh, if you could, yeah. Since you have the, the table of contents up, and so I, I assume that everyone can, can see those, can see it. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the title of the work then, which maybe you don't see, is, there it is, Balancing All the Symmetrical Imperative of Writing. 
and which I explained the, the title and the subtitle at the beginning. Uh, the table of contents in the in the uh, will, it'll begin with a discussion of the Iliad and and this, let's say the bilateral relationship, the bilateral relationship between the Iliad and um, and Ezekiel's amphora, and the point both of the introduction and of each subsequent chapter is that first of all each of the works reveals a, let's say a mania for symmetry to use the expression that um, the phrase that Malloy uses there is a mania for symmetry in Oedipus and Hamlet on the part of uh, Sophocles and, and Shakespeare and then also on a second level, my, my own mania for symmetry. Um, and I, I don't know if I had mentioned at some point, I was, I was in mathematics and physics in college and my, my absolute favorite classes were in calculus and geometry and, and so on. And, and I suppose there's a, a character that I haven't changed all that much and that the, um, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing my own mania as it were into the analysis of the bilateral, <clears throat> the Ezekiel like relationship between Oedipus and Hamlet. The same with um, uh, Metamorphoses, uh, Book Eight, that's the um, uh, Daedalus and Icarus chapter. Inferno 26 is the uh, Ulysses chapter of, of Dante's Inferno. So you have two, two voyagers one from a masterpiece of Latin literature, the other from uh, uh, medieval Italian. Um, oh, by the way, uh, with the third, um, and this I'm, I'm quite fascinated by, I'm a, a huge fan of, um, of Joseph Conrad. I think in, in part it's, um, it has to do with my, my, own, my own biography, I suppose. Uh, my father dropped out of high school when he was 16, which was the legal age in the United States, and he joined the American Merchant Marines. He was a sailor. He was an ordinary seaman for many years. And um, then it kind of goes into... And he, he sailed on a ship called the Joseph Conrad once. But anyway, um, I have, if you're interested, I've published an essay, and it's online. The title, and it's about Heart of Darkness and a little bit about the secret sharer. <clears throat> it's called um, Always Symmetrize, Always Symmetrize, which is, um, it's, a, it's an echo, well, some of you hear it, of uh, Frederick Jameson's uh, a watchword, I guess, a motto with which he begins his book on the political unconscious. He says, always historicize. So my answer to that is, is always, always symmetrize. It's called uh, Always, Always Symmetrize, Forging Bonds, Forging Bonds in Heart of Darkness. And, um, and I, I think it, it may have been before I had this idea of the symmetrical imperative, but it's basically, if, if you read the essay, you'll see that what I bring out is the way in which Conrad did not miss an opportunity to symmetrize the uh, related uh, various, to symmetrize the various aspects of Heart of Darkness and also the Secret Sharer, and to symmetrize both on the level of the human body, where there are conflicts, and on the level of the, um, of the architectural body, where the emphasis or the, what's produced is not disharmony, is not a conflict, but rather harmony. Uh, and then going on, the, uh, the love song of Geoffrey Kufrock sailing to Byzantium. Uh, I'm really looking forward, I've, for years, I thought there's a really interesting bilateral relationship between the great Gatsby. Uh, all of you will recognize that. The Loser, maybe less so. It's a novel by the Austrian writer, Thomas Bernhardt. This is one of, one of my favorite writers. Um, and anyway, that's, uh, and then with Joyce, uh, Dubliners and a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. 
is uh, is is a pretty obvious no brainer choice uh, for Beckett, uh, Murphy, and and Malloy. I talked a bit about Murphy and waiting for the dough today. Um, I have chapters in this book. <clears throat> I have uh, separate chapters on waiting for the dough and end game, and I want to come back and do a chapter in which, I mean, if it turns into a book, I, I want to I want to um, basically. What I really enjoy doing is talk, is talking, maybe talking too much, um, but I'd, I'd like to uh, to give guest lectures on some of these works if it becomes, if it they lead eventually to a book that's fine, uh, to the uh, to the lighthouse of Mrs. Dalloway again, uh, two novels, no, no brainer, two novels by Virginia Woolf. I'm really, I'm I've developed a late in life fascination with Virginia Woolf and look forward to um, uh, to talking about her and maybe writing about her as well. Uh, correction and Wittgenstein's Nephew, those are, uh, Correction is, is Bernhard's masterpiece. Uh, Wittgenstein's Nephew is perhaps a minor work in relation to it, but still I'd like that major minor bilateralism, a balancing of major and minor which I'll be doing there. And um, my perennial favorites, my two favorite, right, the, th the three of them is Thomas Bernhard. The Book of Disquiet is the English translation of Fernando Pessoa's uh, masterpiece and a short history of decay. I don't know if you would recognize it. It's uh, in French. It's uh, the language in which he wrote it, uh, Précis de Décomposition. It's by uh, Samuel Beckett's Romanian friend, Emil Chiron is uh, another another great favorite of mine. And again, there, I have separate chapters on the Book of Disquiet and the Short History of Decay in this book, and I want to bring them together in the form of, of a... Um, actually, I, I did this in Bucharest a few years ago. I, I talked about those two books, <clears throat> and I'd like to um, do it again because they're real favorites, and I'm real fascinated by them. But maybe that's a good place to stop. I could say a few things about Hamlet. Um, if you'd like me to talk, talk about Hamlet, invite me back sometime, and, um, and I will. But um, I need, I, let, me, um, let me go and get a drink of water from the, uh, from the fountain. I was about to say the soda, the soda fountain. It's not a soda fountain, the water fountain, and I'll be right back. I don't know if you can see on the on the back of my door. It's too small, but that that is a photo. It's a talk I gave in Bucharest a few years ago. But that's a photo of Beckett directing uh, Vatnauf Godot. So I think it's a very very beautiful. Well, you know, I, I will say a couple of things about that. Um, uh, Alan Schneider, Beckett's uh, legendary American director. American director. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, American director. Yes. Right, the, Ameri the American director, Alan Schneider, said that what he thought was most important about Beckett's theater, if, he, if someone asked him what was the major innovations in Beckett's theater, he didn't say, oh, it's theater of the absurd. No, no, he didn't say that. He said it's that Beckett brought painting and music to the stage. Painting and music, and not not music in the form of songs, to be sure, but music in the form of of, of movement. What Beckett called when he, Beckett talked about form and movement, he said, "Like the form that we have in music, and it's very very musical quality, very choreographed quality." Um, and also, as far as painting goes, these very very powerful visual images that Beckett's created. And can can you see it well enough? What I love about that photo is the way he's holding his arm. It seems to me that he could be hold, either holding a paintbrush or he could be conducting an orchestra. So you have the uh, painting and music. And of course, he's been he's brought them onto the the stage or staged them as a theatrical performance. Okay, I'm going to get a drink of water.
Uh, I would uh, request our participants uh, to uh, question to to type their questions in the chat box. Uh, you, you can understand that we, we are running far behind the time schedule. Therefore, I would request you to to if you have any question, uh, I will request you to type your questions in the chat box, and Professor Cosino would be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Cosino, for this wonderful talk. Uh, now I open this session, sir, with your permission. I open this session to question and answer. Uh, we can take a couple of questions. And uh, someone has written in the chat box. Uh, sir, can you uh, read them? Can you see them or shall I read them out? Do I find an image of, of center with respect to up to waiting for the dough? Um, and you can tell me if uh, if this is an if this is an answer to your question. What I find so fascinating, I mean everything I find fascinating about Beckett's production, but <clears throat> you'll notice it, it, again if you look at Vatnauf Godot is that the character who stands at the center of the stage throughout throughout the play and it's true in both acts one and two for the most part is lucky in other words the the one character who never talks except in that that one for that one exception the character who has no real interrelationship relationship with the other characters so it seems very strange and i remember at washington college several years ago there was a production of, of waiting for godot in which the director had lucky standing over by the tree which is that it makes a lot of sense because since he's not talking why not put him off away from the center and that in effect beckett has has created an inversion of what we would what we would expect, and as far as the the center goes. So one one further point, uh, he puts a non speaking character in the center, and throughout the play, and you'll see this for yourself throughout the play, he's always emphasizing these diagonal lines movements away from the from the center, um, and there, there are lots of there are lots of um, with the three characters, the three other characters. Then he oftentimes creates these triangular shapes, so that would again be a, a geometrical figure that distracts attention away from the center. I, I, I hope that will have. So if there's always a bilateral. It, 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 I lost the question before I could. It went off the screen. If I could read it, if there is a bi always a bilateral. Can I ask, sir? I, I'd have to see it written. I think I have trouble hearing because of the of of the connection. Can Can I see the question again? Yes, sir. It's in that box. You can see. It's there in the chat box. Sorry, it is there in the chat box. Um, I don't see it though. Am I okay, sir? Oh, I'm I see. Sorry. Okay, hold on a second. No, I, yeah, okay, yes. I, I get it. I'm, I'm, it, yeah, I'm, I'm technologically challenged. Okay, the, very interesting talk. Thank. Please go on if you can. Thank you, whoever said that. Someone else said yes. Uh, can we say that binary opposition? Is also a part of bilateral relationship. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I would imagine that the answer is is yes. Um, that uh, again, binary oppositions or antitheses. It's that idea of the of the interplay. Of the interplay on, on. Let me let me pause for a moment. That. You know, on the human level, down here, 
you have that interplay of antitheses. Up here, you have the interplay of resemblances, or at least an interplay that is free from tension. And then you have the, the symmetrizing between lower and upper, as it were, between what's happening on the human level and what's happening on the architectural or the the post the post human maybe if that's what if that's what post human means. Oh, let me tell you um, one of my favorite one of my uh, one of my absolute favorite books, uh, and I would have written my dissertation on him fifty years, six a long long time ago, if I had known about him. Uh, the Portuguese writer Fernando Pessoa, uh, the English translation, the Book of Disquiet, um, which I have trouble pronouncing in Portuguese, but and I wrote, a, I did write a book on this called, um, and it got good reviews, uh, called uh, an unwritten novel, and that's online also, as as all just about all my work is. Um, Pessoa says, and I think this is an extraordinary statement about the, the relationship between the lower and the, the higher. He says that literature, literature is real, realization. Literature is realization without the taint, T-A-I-N-T, -T, without the stain, without the stain or the taint of reality. And it's that play on words, and I think it's there in Portuguese also. It's very, very good, and um, it works very well in English. So down here you have reality, and it's very tainted, tainted by tension, tainted by conflict. And then up here you have realization, which is like reality, real, real, real is a, the same, the same, begins with the same phoneme, but it's a trans. It's a transformation. So yeah, I mean, they, you have a binary here, binary here, and then there's a binary relationship between the lower and the the higher. To be very up to date, I'll say between the human and the the post human, if I can be permitted. Okay, I find it is binary. So if it was always a bilateral symmetry in each and everything waiting for the go, in the statement, nobody comes, nobody goes, it's awful, they're, they're that symmetry. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of a thesis, antithesis, or not, not, not antithesis, well, yes, it is. No, nobody comes, nobody goes, it's awful, is, is to be sure an example of, uh, of, of symmetry. Um, Oh, and and maybe this, this may be related to that question. There's a um, remember in in waiting for the dove. Vladimir tells the story of the two thieves, of the good thief and the bad thief. He begins to say one of the one of the thieves was saved. It's a reasonable percentage. Um, and then in, as he continues, the um, Oh, Estragon asks him, saved from what? And he says, uh, from, from being damned, I think, something like that. So the opposition between saved and damned. Um, if you read the Gospels, um, the four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that Vladimir is not a biblical scholar by any means. This, it's very inaccurate. But uh, Beckett said, uh, there's, there's a... Um, a, a sentence that I think he attributed it to, to St. Augustine, but wrongly, and I don't want to not to go into the details of who actually said this, but Beckett quoted this line, and the line is, if you're ready for it, um, do not despair, do not despair, one of the thieves was saved. Do not presume one of the thieves was damned. I was reminded by nobody comes, nobody goes. It was that, that balancing back and forth. And the interesting thing, if you heard someone, if there were someone who doesn't understand English, heard the sentence, do not despair. One of the thieves was saved. Do not presume. 
one of the thieves was damned. And you ask the person, what do you notice about that sentence? They would say, oh, it's really, it's so balanced. But the second part seems to be saying exactly the same thing as the first part. But of course, it's not true. It's not true that there's a, an absolute imbalance, uh, an antithesis <coughs> on the level of meaning. So uh, a, um, a resemblance on the level of sound and on the level of syntax, but an antithesis on the level of semantics. Okay. Um, if waiting for Godot is moralistic, what is the what is the moral, sir? Um, I don't. I I wouldn't say that it's it's moralistic. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. There's a there is there's a lesson to be learned, but it's not a lesson. Um, oh. Yeah. Okay. There's not a, a, a lesson that can be formulated as um, you know. Don't take wooden nickels, or don't you know? Don't wait. For, don't wait too long. <laughs> don't wait till the. Um, don't wait till hell freezes over, or something like that. No, it's not that kind of um, of of moral. It's. I think you know one of one of the most. Powerful statements of, of morality, and I've, I have referred to it, I did refer to it a, a little while ago, and I, I won't be able to quote it exactly, but it'll be close enough to, um, to, to be comprehensible, I think. And it's by uh, this woman, uh, a female, a woman philosopher, then a Jewish philosopher, French Jewish philosopher, uh, Simone Weil, with a W, W E I L, uh, whom I, I referred to before, and who I, I think is one of the, the towering figures, towering figures of, of 20th, 20th century thought. Uh, in one of her books, I referred to uh, Gravity and Grace. In another one, uh, called in French uh, Le Racinement, and translated into English as The Need for Roots. She talks about the relationship, or say she talks about enslavement, about subservience. And, and what she says, and I, I did mention this before, what she says is that the opposite the opposite of, subser of subservience, of enslavement, is not freedom, but rather obedience. Obedience to the law, obedience to a higher law. And in the, um, and it's a, a phrase that I have, I have very, very much in mind. Um, and and actually, I, I did a video. For, uh, several years ago, I don't think it's, I'm not sure if it's online, um, a video in which I talk about the diff, well, and I, I refer to it today, earlier, the difference between the enslavement of Lucky to Pazzo, of Vladimir and Estragon to Godot, and the obedience that, um, that the actors give to to Beckett. Um, also, the um, there's something about it, another way of making this point, and I re I refer to it again in this book in the chapter on waiting for Godot is the difference between um, intrinsic and extrinsic reasons for acting. Um, you have the, with uh, Vladimir and Estragon, you have the extrinsic purpose. They think that some benefit is going to come to them because of, of waiting. Now, with the actors, on the other hand, there's no benefit outside of, outside of, uh, of, of, um, outside of creating 
this very beautiful um, literary work, theatrical experience, there is no no extrinsic benefit to the all of the, the many times that they obey Beckett and move as he tells them to move, pause if and when he tells them he tells them to pause. So maybe you know the uh, moral having to do with the the difference between doing something because of of some benefit that's going to come come to you, and simply and in contrast to that, doing something because it's the right thing to do that it's in obedience to some higher principle. Okay. Thank you. Is, uh, I, I hope that that, um, that answers your question. Is Lucky's long time rate an expression of Beckett's strong critique yes. of in Sorry? Yeah. Of, um, of, of enlightenment philosophy. Um, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it never, never occurred to me. Um, what I find interesting about the, the tirade is Beckett divided it very clearly in his production notebook. He divided it very clearly into three parts. Uh, the first part, and, and he, um, he gave little titles. The first part is the, uh, indifferent, the indifferent heavens, I think it is, or the indifferent God. So given the existence, qua qua qua, of a God, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so the indifferent God. And then in the middle, second section, you have dwindling man. And then third is he quotes a phrase from the, the last passage in the, the tirade, uh, earth ab abode, A-B-O-D-E, earth abode of stones. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you have the idea then of a, um, what that has to do with, um, the Enlightenment, I, 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 I really don't, I really don't know. Um, what I see in it is that uh, there's, there's a lot to say. Um, let, let me step back for a moment. I saw recently on um, on Facebook. I look at Facebook a lot, and I, I learn a lot from Facebook. There was an advertisement for a book called Samuel Beckett and Catastrophe. Samuel Beckett and Catastrophe. And I put up as a comment right away, I wonder if some of the authors, there are various authors who contribute to it, I wonder if they also talk about the, the, the bilateral relation between strophe and antistrophe. Because for me, Catastrophe is a universal or a timeless term. Catastrophe is what happens in the Iliad. There's a catastrophe in Oedipus, catastrophe in Hamlet. Uh, did I say uh, in in the uh, the Iliad as as well? Catastrophe in the the root meaning of the word means something is is overturned. A stro strophe means turn, and kata means down. So you could say that lucky speech conveys the idea of a of human life as a catastrophe, as a moving down, um, a, a downward turn, let's say. But then also the play itself, as I've been bringing out in the course of, of my discussion, the play itself is continually, uh, well, let me, let me pause. I wrote an essay and that it's in a book by, um, Ran, Ranjan Ghosh. Is that the correct pronunciation? Ranjan Ghosh, uh, called this, it's uh, called In Dialogue with Godot. Uh, and my essay I've, I've put online, it's called, uh, Beckett contra C-O-N-T-R-A. So against Beckett contra Aristotle. A choral reading, so choral ch, 
O-R-A-O, like a chorus. And the, the point that runs through the basic idea of that is that the, um, that the play itself restages the chorus of a Greek tragedy. It's also, I, I have it in, in here too, I, I come back to that idea, the back and forth strophe antistrophe movement. So you have the catastrophe, and, and also it's, um, you know, Pazzo says they give birth astride a grave, right? An instant life is, life is like that. We're there, but between birth and death is just a, a brief moment. I'm reminded, and I, I hope usefully, again, of a, a very a favorite line from um, Fernando Pessoa's The Book of Disquiet. He says, um, we all know that we're going to die in dying. <coughs> Excuse me, it's certainly the, the subject of, of Lucky's monologue. But we also, we also think that we're immortal. Well, we also know that we're immortal, something like that. I don't have the exact, and I don't want to look it up. Um, he's, and he says that the belief of our immortality, he said, it's not a desire. It's not a wish. He said, it's a visceral logic. So visceral, it's down in the visceris, down in the stomach. It's a, it's a visceral logic that resists, and then it resists, and he ends with an ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> he doesn't say exactly what it is, but it's, it is this idea that, um, as far as Lucky's monologue, I don't know with Enlightenment philosophy, but the catastrophe, the downward movement, and also the back and forth movement. So let's say, getting back to Socrates' line, that, that life will, will, will culminate in a ruin, in death, unless symmetry, unless balance informs that body and elevates that body, transforms it into an immortal architectural body. Maybe, maybe something like that. It was just distorted down in complete form. Yeah. But in Becky's works, the body in most cases is distorted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, again, it was, it's, there are two parts, I guess, maybe not quite, I don't. I'm sure I see the relation between the two, but I would just go back to what I said about the pause as being a transformation of waiting, so that with wait, it, it doesn't break the, um, the totality so much as it creates another kind of bilateral relationship. With waiting, it's between expectation and frustration. With pause, the pause creates, it, it, it divides. Um, yeah, well, it, it creates a, a, um, a back and forth movement between movement and stasis, sound and, and silence. Um, with respect to the, the distortion of the body, the, um, the, the failings of the, of the body, the weakness of the, the human body, frailty, of the of the body, I know that there's going to be a, a this a talk. Uh, oh, Hannah Simpson is giving a talk on disability, and I know that that's a, a huge subject of, of which I know very very little, except that it's it's uh, it's out there. Um, one of my my favorite example, one of one of them in Waiting for Godot, of um, say of a kind of disability. Or a kind of distortion or weakness, at least of the of the body, is when Estragon and Vladimir decide that they're going to do the tree. Remember, do I do I dare do it? No, I don't. I don't dare do it. Where you stand up and you put your foot 
by your knee and you, you're, on, you're on one foot and you're balancing yourself and so on. So they do, uh, uh, Estragon does the tree, but only for a moment is he, he falls off balance. And the stage direction is he staggers. And then the next moment, Vladimir, Vladimir says, oh, let me try. And the same thing, he, for a moment, he's, he's doing the tree, he adopts the, up, the upright, the vertical position, but then once again, he staggers. It's a bit, you have the, the same stage direction. And what I notice about that is that, so you have this imbalance, you have a, a failing of the body, but it's a failing that creates a balance because first Estragon does it, and then Vladimir does it. So Beckett creates a, a rather pleasing symmetry out of the, the downward, the catastrophe, if you will. There's a strophe and an antistrophe that's created out of that. You, you, we could think of, the, of, a, of distortion as a kind of catastrophe, as a kind of fall. <clears throat> Relativism would be appropriate. Appropriate to what? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, um, if it's moral relativism, I, I don't think so. I think there's a very, very strict, um, abs I think, absolutism. Um, the quest for perfection, um, and since uh, perfection, uh, perfectionism, perfectionism, is a word that, that I would use. There's a, um, you're, you're welcome, Bill, and I hope that I've, I've answered your question. There's a beautiful quotation from, um, again, Simone Weil, uh, whose work I, I could not recommend too highly. Um, is that what I meant to say? Yes, I, I recommend it very, very highly indeed. And she says at one point, and it's in Gravity and Grace, she says, uh, every work has an, has an author. Every work has an, has an author. So you have only here, here's Beckett who writes Waiting for the Doe. Here's Homer who writes The Iliad. Here's Shakespeare who writes Hamlet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but she goes on and says, but as it becomes more perfect, or as it becomes perfect, the work acquires, the work becomes anonymous. The work becomes anonymous. And I think that maybe that word anonymous, as I've been using architectural body, that the anonymity of a work uh, could be could be related in some way to post-humanism, because in the next breath she says, "Okay, the work as it be, as it is when it is perfect, when it is perfect, it it becomes anonymous." And here it goes. It imitates the anonymity of divine art. It imitates the anonymity of divine art. So that idea of you know, the quest for perfection of, of writers and whoever the, the writer is, insofar as he aspires to perfection, he's going, to, in Simone Weil's view, and I would, in my own view as well, is going to come closer and closer as a creator with a small c. He will come closer and closer to the achievement of the creator with a capital C, if you will. There's a wonderful book by uh, Dorothy Sayer, S-A-Y-E-R, um, who she wrote mysteries, ancient British writer, wrote mysteries, but she also wrote a, 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 a translation of, of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. And she has a book called The Mind of the Maker, the mind of the maker, the capital M. And the point that, that she makes, I haven't read it for a while, but basically is that we can intuit the work of the ultimate creator, of the creator of divine art. 
we can intuit his procedures by looking at the work of human creators. And we can come to certain conclusions. We can deduce certain principles from our study of their, of their work. Thanks, Professor Tom. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny because... <laughs> thank you, who, Professor who, you know, No, but the thing is, the, um, well, thank you, Milan, for a brainstorming session. Great. No, but the funny thing is, uh, Cousineau is a, is, a, is it's a French name. My father's family is from Canada, from Quebec. Um, but, and, and I'm from New England. My wife is from New York, but we live down in Maryland, which is, is, is south. And we've lived here for a long time. But um, the Cousineau is a very unusual name here. There are very few ethnic names in this area. And whenever, like going to a doctor's office or going to a dentist or whatever, the receptionist will always, when she comes out into the waiting room, she'll always say, Mr. Tom, because they don't know how to pronounce Cousineau. And then every once in a while, a receptionist will say, Mr. Cousineau. And I'll say, oh, you must have studied French. And they'll say, no, I was in high school with your sons. <laughs> so anyway, okay, so Mr. Tom, thanks, Professor Tom. For the brainstorm, he says, take a, take a bow. <laughs> what a sweetheart. Um, lovely. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Professor Tom Cousineau, for enriching us with your wonderful deliberation on Beckett's Way for the Dough. Boy. Thank you, Professor Pizzino, for this uh, wonderful lecture. And Professor Pizzino's talk, a theorization of the symmetrical imperative of writing and Beckett's use of body is both phrase and original. And uh, it will be of renewed, in, renewed interest to uh, scholars working on Beckett. And the uh, entire talk was a wonderful blend of traditional scholarship and contemporary theorization. Uh, it is always enriching uh, to listen to his talk, and I would also like to thank our dear participants for their kind participation and patient listening. And with this thankful note, uh, I think it is given. Have a nice day, Professor Puzile. Yeah, it's getting late where you are. It looks like, okay. <laughs> I have to learn. Well, you know, we I did a lot because I'm Catholic, and as a little, I was in Catholic school. For 17 years, and I, I, I prayed a lot with my hands folded, and it has a different significance. But um, uh, Priti Saha says, please come back again. Not only may I, I may come back in person, I'm going to go on Travelocity again. I'm going to find a flight from Bucharest. Well, we will come back again with you when your forthcoming book will be released. Uh, we will uh, organize another event, and we will be happy to share your talk it's very 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 lovely of you and, and thank you again i've, I've um again I, I i do enjoy talking i hope i don't talk too much and um and and talking is a great help for, for writing that i can after i've spoken i can then sit down and i usually write with a pencil and so i can erase a lot and um so maybe i'll I'll get, I'll get down to writing a bit but but thank you once again and um <laughs> And, and see you soon. See you okay. Soon. And I'll be back for the other talks too. Uh, so Hannah Simpson is yes. talking some, sometime in October and um, and I'll, I'll come for her talk. Good. Okay. Bye-bye.